And now everyone, for the moment you've all been waiting for, actually logging in. So, you know, catching up a little bit from the last video, this is over a day for me, so I think I'm just getting my bearings straight, even though I just watched it to make sure I knew where I was. You know, we had had to do a decent bit of laying some groundwork for this fresh boilerplate to finally get to this point. We talked about the double folder auth structure or routing structure, just because it's important to know how to stack routes on routes on routes and imagine them as like this diverging path of trees that you can customize. Talked about how we can use this nice bcrypt library to handle all of the hard work for us for generating our secure salt and hashed passwords. We had talked about the pizza routers being something arbitrary, whatever you intend to protect at some point in time, no matter how dumb and simple it is. Um, yeah, like we, we had talked about quite a bit and we had written uh, this queries here for our users table to include an insert for when we talk about how to write our own registration route, which we'll get to after making a login attempt. And we also talked about this one little find function here that'll be interesting to to teach you all how it ends up working. So, you know, should be fun. Okay, so back over here. We're finally over here. We should be able to get this email and password. Me personally, I always like to like console log or potentially not just console log, but like kind of echo my routes back to me because before I, yeah, see, I forgot to wire up to my auth index here. Good thing I was talking about this. So I always like to test a default response, whether it's like my pizza router that has nothing more than a pizza time message appear or my login router simply echoing back my request body back to myself. I'm using it kind of like a pseudo console log to test my endpoints, their paths and their methods before I begin attempting to build out that logic. So I was talking about that. It's a good thing I had looked because I went over to my auth folders index entry point and I realized I have yet to make the login router on any kind of path for this project. So let's give it a shot. So I'm gonna say route, this router is going to use on the path of login, the logic of the surprise login router like so. Very nice. And I'm gonna go collapse these folders and look into my route index file. And yes, I do have the auth path here. And I believe we had left off with our server having what we expect, which is something's wrong with my coloring here because normally my variables have color. So my VS code's acting kind of funky. So we'll see what ends up happening here. Hopefully everything is okay because I'm used to my extensions color coding these brackets here. So you know what, I'm gonna close this out of uh, curiosity and attempting to open VS code again, see if it changes and those extensions kick on, which they, Oh, there we go. Yeah, I knew something was off with my extensions. That was odd that my VS Code extensions were kicking on. My TS features are now kicking on as well. So that was peculiar to say the least, but sometimes VS Code does have that bug. So if y'all run into it, now you know exactly what I would do in the situation going, something seems off about my VS Code extensions. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Classic IT crowd reference. Um, and it worked, so go figure. Okay, so my routes are connected. My routes index file has the API and auth routers. My API index has the pizza router, which has a get request that we're gonna be pretending is anything we care to protect at some point down the line. And we have our auth index that has our login router, which is a post request to just auth login that should echo back our request body if there is one. So let's see how it all gets put together before I begin writing out more logic. Let's test this stuff out. So I'm gonna go ahead and boot this sucker up. I'm gonna let Webpack rebuild everything and re-output everything like so. I should get a successful build here and looks like we are running on port 3000 and good to go. Let's see what happens. So I'm gonna head over to my browser, not my browser, my Postman window now. So I'll be using Postman to test this. You can use the in-browser version of Postman so you can feel free to use that if you don't have it installed on your computers. But I believe this course recommends that you do. So most of y'all should. First thing I'm gonna do is zoom in so y'all can read what's going on. I might say this to a collection later, so I'm gonna collapse that window here, get, get that out of the way. And right now for this get request, let's just go to localhost 3000 forward slash API forward slash pizza. All right, got my pizza time message, so I know that route is correct coded correctly. I'm gonna make a new tab, drop down to post, localhost 3000 forward slash auth forward slash login like that. I'm gonna head to my body tab. I'm actually gonna zoom this down a little bit, raw 
JSON because that's the only body parser middleware we have right now on my server, that express.json. So the only thing we can test is this JSON stuff here. So I'm expecting to be my users to fill out a login component on my React website that has an email field and a password field. So let's do that. Password one, two, three. It is about lunchtime here at my house, and not for me anyway, but for my cats. And Percival decided to come say hello. Say hi, Percy. This is Percival Dorolo the Third, and he just wants lunch, so he's not exactly talkative right now or so playful. Are you, buddy? Good boy. He's gonna jump back on the desk and probably attempt to step on my keyboard, boop the microphone, or at least mess up my camera with his tail flipping around. He's got the message for now, but he's gonna he'll be back in a minute. He always is. He, he lets me know when it's lunchtime. So now that I have this request body coded out in this JSON format, we're going to click on send. And if it just sends it back to me, that's what I want it to see. Now I know that my, I'm not testing per se, but I do have the things in place working as they should at a fundamental level, which means now I can begin going further with logic now that I know the groundwork is done, right? The, the foundation of the house is set, now I can start building up, right? Because I've seen too many students and I was kind of guilty of this myself early on in this, in this walkthrough of not trying to run my project as I was coding and talking about stuff, which can be kind of dangerous when you have some kind of small error at the beginning and you forgot to take care of it by just checking for it. So that's why I like doing stuff like this. My routes are good to go. I know they're all wired up and correct. Now it's time to do what we want to do. So first things first, if someone's trying to log in, we got to make sure that email exists. So check for the user's email is our first goal. So I'm going to say const maybe user found equals a call to my lovely db index, this user's default export right here, right? So I'm gonna go back to my router and I'm gonna say import the db object from up one, up one more db. And remember, I don't have to write my index. It will automatically look for that, which means I can now await this promise. Do not forget that because if you don't wait for that promise to resolve, your code will just run synchronously and you'll get no response, or at least not the one you expect. So we're gonna write db.users.find. Now he's crying in the background instead of coming back, go figure. So if you'll hear a cat meowing in the background, it's Percival telling me it is lunchtime, but I told him I had to make a video first, dude. So this find function currently doesn't do anything. So here's what we're gonna be doing. I'm going to first off kind of use my res.json again as kind of like my console log. It's, I mean, you can console log if you don't want to, if you don't mind hopping back to your terminal, but I'm just going to use Postman. It's kind of like my pseudo console log as I test this out step by step. So we got to find that email, but we never actually wrote that query because I wanted to leave it to this video because let's show you something cool. So we could write find that takes the email as a string, as the argument. And over here for our escape position, we could pl place the email in this escape array, because remember this is for preventing SQL injection attacks. The MySQL library will take these values, confirm that they don't contain SQL syntax, and place them onto question marks in the order they appear in order to make sure that someone can't inject us with bad malicious code. So this will be nothing more than a select star from the users table, where the column of email in my database equals question mark and that question mark will end up becoming this thing in the array it'll make sure this is safe to place and it goes whoop and places it right on that question mark once it knows it's safe and that's how it works now the cool thing about the mysql library and escape parameters is there's actually a couple different tricks you could do this find function will now only work for email and that's it nothing more ever but what if we wanted to find someone's username or their first name or by their registration date or something like that well, check this out. Instead of calling this email, let's just call it value. And in front of that, let's pass in another argument of string data type called column. And column's purpose, column's purpose is to say, well, instead of saying where email equals, I want to say where my column equals. So watch this. Something cool I learned not too long after graduating, and I wish it was in the course, so here it is. Um, I can take this column argument put it in my escape array, and instead of email, it should be value, there we go. I can now replace this with double question marks rather than single. Double question marks 
indicates to the MySQL library that the escaped value is going to be a column name, and it will check that for its, well, I guess, safety and veracity to make sure that it's also safe to place there. This is a very cool syntax to know how to do to write very, very dynamic queries that still are protected against common SQL injection attacks. So we now have this nifty find function that can find someone by their ID, their username, their email, register, first name, last name, middle initial, whatever's in that table that you want as a column, you can now find it. So with that in mind, we're gonna head back to our login router where now TypeScript is angry at us that we're not passing in any values. So remember the first argument was the column. I'll say that's, the, whoa, what letters were those? This will be the email. My keyboard's a little bit to the left, so my hands are trying to get under the microphone here. Um, so that's our email column we're trying to find. And this email from the request body is what I'm trying to find. Let's see what the response is. Now, if you recall me talking about this, any kind of select statement will always return an array of objects. So let's go ahead and destructure it right there with an ES6 array destructure, the same thing y'all do for your use states and the React side of stuff. And that's it. Check out what we got. We had found that user record in my database, which is super cool. And it's an object. Let's find out what happens if I don't have that email address. Let's mess up a typo here on my login. Let's say someone made a typo in their login credentials. What happens? We simply get nothing, all right? Interesting, interesting, interesting. That appeared as nothing there in Postman. Let's see what that looks like in a console log. Maybe JavaScript will say null or undefined or something like that, whereas this response looks like nothing. Click on send here, we get nothing, console logs undefined. So it's an undefined value. If we try and destructure from an array with nothing inside of it, it just gives us a variable whose value is undefined. And we can use that to our advantage because inside of if statements, undefined is considered falsy. So I can say if the opposite of undefined, which is true, and we can read this as if there is no record found, then we should either throw a new error like that that says invalid credentials or email not found or something like that so we can error handle it ourselves or if you wanted to get fancy you could say return so we stop all of our code running here a response status code of 401 the status code 401 means unauthorized send a json response that says message email does not exist or something like that or we can just say invalid credentials I am of the opinion that keeping your error messages for something like this vague to not give hackers going, oh, okay, so I need to find this email. I mean, there are some workflows that you can get away with it. I like being vague at first and realizing if I need to have more custom error handling, I can always come back and change this. So if I had thrown a new error, it would have gotten thrown down here to this catch and follow this workflow. If you want a custom 401 message, this is how you can do it. And this is the advantage of not using a framework like Passport that has some opinionated and default responses in the sense that I can customize my responses as I see fit here with this logic as I go through. So let's give it a, sh a shot. There we go, invalid credentials. Let's fix the credentials by fixing the email and it gets the record. So it goes that down that workflow. Okay, very cool. Next, because we have that user record, we have to compare the password they're trying to log in with, this thing right here, against the salt and hash in our database. And we have a handy utility function on that that we coded the other day from our passwords.ts file right here, where we had compare hash. We're gonna pass in the rec body password against what's found in the database. So back to our login routers. And here we can either do it in one go or two. We can say, um, you know, if the user record is not found or the, we'll say compare hash function. It should auto import that for me, which it did. I'm going to organize these imports. So my most generic ones on top and my specific ones are on bottom. Just me being a weirdo. I like organizing it in that fashion right there. Um, okay. We're going to write that compare hash function because it returns a Boolean to us, right? It should return a Boolean to us, which it does. There's that TypeScript returns Boolean. Uh, it's going to take the user found dot password, compare it Nope, JKL Mayo. It's gonna take this password from the rec body first, which is that one right there. And then over here, it'll take the one in the database, which is user found.password. So 
My bad on that one. Plain text password first. That comes from the rec body, the form they filled out. User found out password is what comes from the database, right? That way we have to make sure that if the user is not found, bad credentials. But if that is true, then that's okay and skips that. But if this one is false, meaning the passwords don't compare, that means it's also a bad login. So down here, we can change this to say login successful since we know what the data looks like. And that way, if this appears when we expect it to, we're on the right path. So this is a completely valid login. So hold on to your butts. <laughs> okay, well, let's find out what I did wrong. Maybe I did something in my head that made sense that somehow failed, which is okay. So, well, we know the email thing was working just a moment ago, so I'm wondering why compare password or compare hash didn't work the way I expected it to. So we have user found not password, and that makes sense. That's that thing from the users table that should be password one, two, three, that's assault and hash. The password they're trying to log in with, which should be password one, two, three. So everything seems fine. So go figure this ends up in catastrophe. So let's debug it. I mean, Previous, like a year ago, I would have decided to scrap this recording or stop recording here and pause and debug it off camera, figure out what I did wrong and explain in a different way or jump cut it together. But I think there's lots of value in seeing me screw something up and try and reason out loud how it ended up getting there. So everything seemed to be working the way I expected until this compare hash function came into play. So I'm going to console log its output to see why I'm ending up getting false on this rather than true. So Fire away a new request, check the logs, and it returned true. Interesting. It returned true? Well, come on then, hold on. <laughs> That's interesting, because I was like, okay, maybe something went wrong in like the how I outputted the hash. Yeah. Well, this is an or statement, so if one or the other is true, no, I did do it backwards. So if y'all are watching this and you're yelling at me to say if this returns not true, ugh, that's what it is right there. Oh my goodness. That's one way to do it. You know what? Let's just redo this to say if the, oh, hold on. If the user is a truthy value and the compare has is a truthy value, we're going to call that a successful login attempt versus the other way around just so i don't have to think logically backwards there let's go ahead and do it that way there we go so we just had to rethink our inks right there so this is checking if users email is found and if passwords compare and pass right pass a test that means it's a successful login Otherwise, something went wrong down here. We're going to rethink our inks on that one and just try and redo it to not have to worry about something goofy going on. So let's try that again. So this should be a completely valid login. Thank you, like I expected. Oh, nothing like console log-driven development telling you where you screwed up. I was like, true, that's not what I expected to see. My favorite kind is that false positive going, wait, the code is working how I thought it should be working. I just wrote it wrong that way. So let's screw up the email address. Very good. Let's fix the email address. Test again. Successful. Mess up the password. Invalid. Let's mess up both. I'll make sure something weird doesn't happen. And voila. Put those passwords and email back. Test it backwards and forwards, leftwards and rightwards, upwards and downwards, wonk aways, whatever wonk away you can think of. And we get login successful. And that's the important tidbit right there. That's it. That is all the login logic we really have to worry about. And that's how it's end up going to be working, right? That's how it's going to be working even with Passport or without Passport. It's fairly simple to wire up yourself, which is why I'm teaching y'all to do it this way without Passport first so y'all logically know how simple it can be. But again, like having to think of these conditionals and when errors happen and whatnot, Passport can help streamline some of that by abstracting logic out of here. It'd be kind of nice if we had one line of code and that's it. But ultimately, it's fairly simple to get up and working. But in the next video, we're gonna talk about instead of sending just a successful login message, which doesn't really help us, instead, we're going to generate a token based on this user's information that represents, hey, this token says they logged in, that hotel key card, you checked in, here you go, do what you want with it. And that's where we're gonna pick up the next video where we actually start building our JSON web tokens. See you there.